Welcome back. And now we're going to start talking about predator avoidance. And this is one of the things that really drives lots of behaviors that you see on a reef. And effectively, uh, in any ecosystem, there's an arms race between the prey and the predator. And as a prey item becomes better at evading its predators, it's more likely to be successful. Equally, if a predator becomes better at finding and catching its prey, it's going to become more successful. And so over evolutionary time, we have this enormous diversity of different strategies that you find on a reef for trying to hunt prey and then evade predators. So avoiding predators is a strong selection force on all organisms that you find on a coral reef. And so uh, many organisms have developed very specific uh, specializations and adaptations in order to cope with this kind of pressure. So let's look at some of these. The first one would be shoaling. Now shoaling is simply the word we give to the practice of multiple fish coming together for some kind of social reason. It could be that they're coming together to spawn and reproduce, or it may be in the case of schooling, which is what's happening here, that they're all swimming in the same direction and trying to evade predators. So there is a difference between shoaling and schooling. Now, there's a number of advantages for a fish if it schools. Principally, of course, you have many, many sets of eyes looking out for predators. Secondly, if a predator is approaching a school, it can be bewildered and, and unable to act because it doesn't know where to, where to target. And then thirdly, even if it does attack something, the chances that any individual will be attacked are rather remote. So there's a sort of safety in numbers. Now, of course, Schooling is not the only, always an advantage. There are some disadvantages of schooling, and we can perhaps relate to that by just thinking about what it's like if you have to live with many, many others of the same species. Um, so typically, for example, if the amount of resources, which is food or space, is limited, then you end up with competition and aggression. Similarly, if there's some kind of disease outbreak, then that can move throughout the school very, very rapidly, so they're potentially more vulnerable to disease. But generally what happens is that you have an inverse density dependence. What that means is that as you increase the density of prey, the risk of an individual being eaten goes down. Now that means there's safety numbers. It also means if you look a bit different, your chances of being eaten are very, very high. Now the next kind of uh, of way of avoiding predators is to use refuges and we've already alluded to this and here of course we have a bunch of coral reef fish that are all just sitting just above these finger type corals but they can retract quickly within the safety of these corals as they're doing now if a predator is present. Now refuges which is really measured as the number of, of holes and crevices and cracks and things that fish can hide in uh, are very very important and if we lose the complexity of those refuges, that can have a huge impact on the number of fish and their diversity. So typically, as you increase the number of refuges and you increase the complexity of the substrate, you end up with more and more fish and a greater variety of fish species, so diversity goes up as well. And this is one of the reasons why, when we're concerned about the effects of disturbances on corals, because co disturbances can reduce the structural complexity of the reef, this can have a direct negative effect on the hiding places for these prey. And such reefs that have relatively little structure often have less productivity. And we'll be returning to that in other lectures. However, if you then scale down to an individual species and one population living maybe on one coral head, things can be quite different. Now, there might not be a big advantage to joining a large school of the same species or maybe a large shoal of the same species. So looking here, if you look on the left, what we have here is a coral and there's a few dark fish, which we're going to call damselfish, living among it, among it. And they're actually fairly well sheltered. If you look on the right of the screen, we have the same coral, but now we have more damselfish trying to live there. Notice that there's some predatory fish around the outside. Now, the smaller of those damselfish, or perhaps the least aggressive of them, or the weakest of them, are being pushed out by competition to the outskirts of that coral, which means they're actually quite vulnerable. And therefore, um, the probability that they're going to get eaten by a predator is considerably greater. So in this sort of situation, actually the risk of being eaten can go up depending on how many 
prey there are trying to share the same resource. So at a very small scale, it isn't always the best strategy to join a shoal. It might be better to try and find a piece of habitat that has a fairly small shoal with it so you can compete relatively well. Okay. Now, so far we've mostly focused on predator-prey interactions and individual behaviours. But, in fact, some of the fundamental characteristics of all marine organisms can be traced in some part to predator-prey. So, one of the characteristics of marine organisms is they have a bipartite life cycle, which means they spend some of their time sort of on a reef habitat, say, and some of their time out in the ocean in the plankton. So let's look at this. Here's a parrotfish. This is an adult parrotfish. It's reproducing and generating eggs. Those eggs then get swept offshore by ocean currents, and they might spend uh, a month or so developing into young fish. And those fish are benefiting by being in the ocean currents, first of all because they get to travel to new places and colonize new habitat, but also the ocean is a relatively low predation environment, so it's a good place for very small fish to start to develop. Once they're large enough, they then come back to the reef, perhaps. Now, the reef, as you can imagine, is covered, it's been with predators, it's been described as a wall of mouths, and so typically when these plankton make their attempt to land, they do so at night, when many of the predators are actually asleep. But once they do land, they have to find somewhere safe to live, so they might then go and find these branching corals that provide good refuges. And as they get larger, they become less vulnerable to predators, and so they'll eventually move out and become free-swimming adults. Now, that's assuming that they come back and use the reef as the nursery habitat, but a number of species, particularly fish and some invertebrates, take the step an extra step further by looking at other kinds of habitats. And so here's an example of some fish that not just, they don't come back to the reef, they go over the reef and come into the lagoon into the mangrove or seagrass. So here are some young snapper, and these snapper are moving around inside the mangrove roots. It's a great place as a nursery because the predators don't feed very effectively in that environment and there's plenty of food. And so they'll stay there until they get large enough to have a fighting chance of surviving out on the adult habitat, which is the reef habitat. And this is called ontogenetic migrations and generates an ontogenetic shift from one habitat to another as they grow. And so this is a strategy that many species employ, uh, particularly in the fish groups, uh, grunts and snappers.